Welcome back. You're watching 101. We're speaking with one of the world's leading ad men, as he's known, Sir Martin Sorrell. You've generally had a very private life. You don't end up in the papers much, but well, you're, I don't, I don't well, I was going to say, but, well, no, I mean it was quite more, more than enough of that. Well, was, yeah, I was going to say <laughs> it was when you had that you know, the divorce. Right. It was very high profile yeah. to, yeah. to Sandra, Lady Sorrel. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting. You're like the guru of the message. You can shape people's perceptions, but that went really quite public. I, I think the answer to your question is that you have to accept that that is one of the things that happens in that particular country. There are other countries where there is similar interest and similar high profile I I exposure. And it goes with the territory and goes with the turf. And I don't think there's anything you can do about it other than be transparent or try and be as transparent as you possibly can and be open about it and communicate with it. I mean, any in any situation like that, when, when the press or television or whatever, I mean, the, the answer from your your office that you're traveling or uh, in a meeting is likely to raise what is, let's say, a minus 10 story to a minus 12. I mean, I find if I, I talk to a journalist, a minus 10 can stay a minus 10, but it's highly likely to go to a minus 9 or a minus 8, whereas if I don't, it'll be more problematic. So I think, you know, well, I think it can be very unpleasant, but I think you, you have to accept that that's the way of the world, particularly in the UK, for those sort of things. How do you handle the, the whole sort of washing dirty laundry laundry in public? Uh, well, I don't know how much dirty laundry was, but well, anyway, yeah. but well, dealing with difficult situations. Well, I think you you have to operate on the basis that everything that that you know, e let's say let's say email communication for a minute. Uh, anybody who writes an email has to operate on the basis that it's going to be public, mm. and you know that's very difficult. I mean, I, sometimes as I look through some of the stuff that goes through our company. Uh, you know, the hair on the back of my neck starts to uh, rise. And it's, um, it's very, very difficult because people use modern technology. Uh, it's almost a verbal reaction. I mean, it's an, just a Pavlovian instinctive reaction. So they will say the first thing that comes in their head and they won't necessarily look at what they've written. Often the spelling and the grammar has all gone out the window. And it's just an instantaneous response. So it's like in the old days, we used to you know, respond by phone. So this is sort of phone, phone by, by writing. And, uh, you know, and then we'll have voice, you know, we're gonna have voice recognition technology that you know, we won't have to write things. So I think that's, you, know, you have to think about that in the way that uh, that is uh, disseminated. Now, tracing your career. I mean, actually, it was a very interesting, just a, to the point. We, in, um, in one of the seven sessions, last sessions in Davos, somebody raised the question about blogspots and, uh, you know, that they go through Google and surely, you know, if they were um, libelous or whatever, uh, that, you know, Google should, well, it's very difficult for Google to monitor uh, the every piece of communication that goes through a blogspot. But, you know, I think there is a censorship issue or a review issue and a responsibility because some of the new technology companies are actually media owners. They're not technology companies. You know, it's ducking the issue to say you're a technology company and therefore you have no responsibility. I think you know, they're really effectively the new media owners and therefore they have the same responsibility that the Daily Telegraph has or the New York Times has in terms of what it prints and the veracity of what it prints. Let's, let's uh, trace your career. You, you had quite a uh, successful career going through the sort of the advertising industry, marketing industry. Ended up at Saatchi and Saatchi. In fact, you were doing very well there. What, what made you break away and, and start up? With I was WP? 40, male menopause. You know, 40 is quite an interesting age because, you know, you're, it's halfway through your career. So you've had 20 years and you've got another 20 years to come. And uh, so I think it's a reflective age. And you look back, maybe as, as people get older and work longer, uh, on average, it'll move up to 45 or something. But I, you know, I always say that um, Jeremy Bullmore, who still who was really a leading national treasurer in the UK in the advertising industry, was chairman of JWT, always used to say we should put a little flag on somebody, everybody's PC, which says in three months' time I will be 40, because people do make big life changes, I think. And that. So I was 40. If I was going to start a business, this was the last opportunity, really. Wanted to have a go. We found this shell company, Wire and Plastic Products, and we were off to the races. Now, I, I know you, you've described it as uh, the success based on 10% perspiration, 10% aspiration, and 80% luck, but you must have had some kind of insight or some particular skill to have grown it the way you have. Well, you make, you make your own luck. Um, you know, I think you need, you need to be persistent. I think you have to move fairly quickly. I, I don't think this business is brain surgery unless you're in, you know, uh, biotechnology or gene research or whatever it happens to be or the applications of it. So I think it's, it's persis persistence and hard work. I think you make your own luck in a way. I mean, if, you know, if, if, if you think 
you know, the world is a series of circles where people are meeting one another or, on, or things are coming into collision, I mean, in a positive way. Uh, I mean, the more that you see, the more that you're exposed to, I think the more odds you are, the, the better the odds are uh, of you being successful. So I'm, a, you know, the same thing is sort of, is sort of engaging with people, getting ideas, the more you do. I mean, that's why something like Davos or Sun Valley or whatever, is so good because you get exposed, you get peppered with ideas and thoughts which if you're sitting in your office or you're on a plane, uh, even if you're reading magazines and newspapers or doing, reading your PC, stuff on your PC from the web, you don't get. What was the biggest challenge you, you faced? Uh, I would say 91, uh, after we acquired Ogilvy, uh, we, we bought Ogilvy for $825 million, half debt half convertible preferred, and my mistake was to think the convertible preferred in a recession was equity, it wasn't, it's, a, it's debt. And so we were over, levered, over leveraged in, uh, with, with Ogilvy in 91. And I think that was a, the, the biggest mistake. I mean I, well, I mean, I make tons of mistakes. Every day, every day I make mistakes. But I think that was the biggest mistake. And we got a, I got us into trouble in early, early 90s, and uh, we came out of it. We had to do a, renegotiate our, our loans, and we had a debt for equity swap with the banking syndicate, and that was the toughest, I think, the toughest time. We came out of that. I think that's made us naturally more conservative, um, and I, I think that was the biggest challenge. What, what do you see as your defining moments? Well, that was clearly a defining moment. I mean, I, I, I can't really say they're defining moments. Um, you know, I suppose when I was born, which family, <laughs> which, fa which, which family I was born into, my mum and my dad. Um, yeah, I think having an education in the UK and Cambridge was important. I think having exposure to Harvard Business School, I think, you know, having two years, I was very lucky actually, I didn't have a gap year, I don't believe in gap years. Um, went to the US, had two years in the US, you know, every day what should the chairman and CEO do and why and three case studies. When you come out, it's a hot house, a greenhouse, and when you come out you think you can rule the world and you can't, and you, can, you might be able to do that, but I'm, you know, Paradoxically, you can only do that in 20 or 30 years when you've got the experience to do that. So I think that was that was that was important. L meeting people abroad, working abroad, studying abroad, very important. So you know, I would encourage anybody who's in the position to do it. I mean, my my focus might not be today. It wouldn't necessarily be the West. It'd probably be more to China and India and and other other places like that. Now you were uh, you were knighted in the Millennium New mm -hmm. Year honours and became mm -hmm. Sir Martin Sorrell. Yeah. Uh, does that make you part of the British establishment? Uh, does it, to some degree, limit what you can and can't do? No, I don't think. I, I mean, I, there's less of a British establishment in the way that people outside the UK think there is, and certainly, you know, Gordon Brown and Tony Blair, maybe to lesser extent, but certainly Gordon Brown is, is, and and actually, to be fair, the Conservative Party as well over the years have broken that down certainly to, from where it was. I mean, Anatomy of Britain, the first Anthony Samson book, which has a chapter in it about the advertising industry, which calls JWT the University of Advertising, is interesting in that sense, because if you read that, that was where it was established, that was when Oxbridge domination was even greater, although some people argue, and I agree, it's, its domination is still there. Um, so no, I don't know whether, and I don't think there are great restrictions on it. I mean, getting a knighthood is good for restaurant reservations, it's good for airline <laughs> seats. I don't know whether it's much good for anything else. In spite of your success and wealth, you, you don't really lead a flamboyant lifestyle as such. What, what do you well, long to I have involved? a good, you know, I mean, I sort of, I can pretty much do not what I want completely, but, you know, pretty much do. And I, I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I've never been it's not one. not showy as such. I've never been one for um, um, big art collections, uh, um, antique cars uh, and the what, like. What's your long-term goal? What do you want to achieve? I want WPP to be uh, undeniably the best company in the industry. I mean, that would be the legacy. Uh, the the what I mean by best the the Pavlovian reaction of any client or anybody who was thinking about joining some, uh, somebody in the industry would be to join one of our companies or to use one of our companies. So that would that to my mind would identify us as the best. So in 100% obviously is a uh, an impossible dream, but in the the vast majority of cases, the the quality of what we have, the quality not the quantity, the quality of what we have is so good that any client who's thinking about new arrangements, existing arrangements, new projects, old projects, whatever, think of us. And anybody who was thinking of moving from one from our competitors would think of us, or anybody who's coming out of an art school or a design school or a university would think of us, or business school would think of us. Is there a price to, <clears throat> is there a price to pay for success? No, I don't think it, I, you, know, you could put it like that. I, I don't, and I, I think 
people explain away on the basis of that, well, you know, because I focus on that, then I, I you know, I, you could, if you, when people say, I can't, don't have time to do that, that's never the case. It's you don't have time because you don't really, it's a question of priorities, right? So maintaining the balance between those three things is terribly difficult to do. And as I say, there are, there are people who can do it, but they're very few and they're very lucky because they've been able to manage their lives in that way. You, of course, will leave behind WPP as a legacy, but how would you like to be remembered? What would you like your legacy? No, as, the, as, the, as the man that was, uh, the, you know, the, the chief architect or the architect of, uh, of what, what I defined before as the best company in the industry. I think that's it, really. Sir Martin, thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.